for many years uh, we have been associated with the NCSTC and the process of identifying and recognizing efforts in science communication has been both encouraging and at times is of concern. While individual efforts by committed organizations, NGOs, educationists have definitely proved to be beneficial in popularizing science as the macro movement is seized with. The challenge of utilizing the enormous and growing communication resources for this purpose I think is still imbued with substantial issues. One is that the level of the uh, government of India and state governments no doubt there is a recognition and uh, support systems are in place and are also being developed. But the challenge of education itself in science as a career is also a matter of utmost concern, particularly for some of us who are now saddled with the responsibility of developing programs in what I would call as a greenfield university. These 12 universities that have come up, of one of which I'm currently leading, are, all, are so greenfield that not a single brick has been laid for these universities. But when I was discussing the matter of what kind of programs we should develop, the immediate concern was that can the new universities, central universities, take on the task of building a good program in the sciences, that too, at the plus two level. So there is a, a separate dynamics of policy making with regard to strengthening science education in the country, particularly at the higher education, in the higher education sector. But that also is limited by the fact that, as all of you know, that hardly we have space for 10 to 12 percent of our students wanting to have education in the university system. That is the reason why 
many new institutions are being created. Although there is a lot of debate about the timing, relevance, and the location of these universities. The second challenge is that is science, and by extension, scientific temper, an important foundation for building a rational, outward-looking society. And that is where I think the role of science, science in communication, or communication of science, any which way you want to use the term in combination, becomes very crucial. And we are often encouraged by the proliferation of mass media in the country. At the time that mass media grew in the country on a very phenomenal basis, some of us in the social education sector, we were highly encouraged that here we are in a situation where mass media, print and electronic media, have grown to such an extent that they provide enormous multiplier opportunities for communicating socially relevant themes of which science and scientific temper is a crucial foundation block. But this was not the situation. There was a multiplicity of channels, but as my erstwhile senior colleague Sri Kiran Karnik pointed out, it was poverty amidst plenty. In the sense that the mass media expansion saw more of the same rather than providing diverse and plural opportunities for communicators to reach their messages to the masses. A very common refrain from the management is that it is so boring. It is so, you know, uninteresting. How can we even use this material? But my response to some of such perceptions, valid as they are from their point of view, because media operates in a free marketplace. Neither the media nor anyone of us intellectuals would like the media to be directed as to what it should do. But at the same time, I think uh, media today has an enormous appetite for content. You have a 24 by 7 scenario. And let us imagine a situation where even if three minutes on the hour is devoted by the 300 plus television channels only, you would realize what kind of an impact that it would have in terms of reaching the right messages. It's not repetitive. It is a slot that it can definitely think of because the remaining 
57, 58 minutes, and if you take away the 17 or 18 minutes of advertisement, is any, in any case repetitive. It's the same story that comes in the loop. So there is definitely an opportunity for what is considered as the largest scientific and technological human resources in, in this part of the world to utilize that opportunity. So the journalism that we taught was always based on uh, uh, what people would criticize, criticize us as Western oriented. But I have a problem in slotting uh, all education into the West and the East because if you look at the tradition of the institutions that we are all talking about, All of them were products of the post-printing press development and therefore they carried the baggage of whatever reformative and renaissance elements that these new inventions were supposed to bring to the communication field. So communications revolution, as somebody would call it, is essentially rooted in the science and technology of the West and therefore it also brings the aberrations of that particular society because the profession is shaped by the nature of industry. Therefore could we have had a Gandhian model of no advertising uh, newspaper? Some people would argue. Now tell that to the media management today, they will easily ask you to climb the nearest tree and say that what? Minus advertising can be run the industry. There is no there is no way. I mean so it's not that models don't exist but models which are built on high capital technology intensive communications environment bring with them certain practices. So you have advertising which subsidizes the main content and uh, to fuel the perpetuation of the content the managers will have to constantly evolve the techniques of content management so that advertisers feel that the medium is viable and the media managers feel that the advertising revenue is stable so therefore what they offer to us would be kind of free lunch as some people would call it. Essentially what media tries to do in this process is to deliver each one of us in this room as a potential, what should I say, commodity for the advertiser. So every newspaper ad that you see today doesn't talk about the thinking or the critical Indian. They talk about that I can give you a socio-economic profile of A category. Engineers, housewives, IT professionals, we deliver them to you. Now that's the language that newspapers and mass media are trying to develop to say that here is a constituency which we can give you. Now I'm trying to suggest all of these minor, what should I say, underpinnings of the industry basics to tell you that the symbiotic relationship between media, media content and the audience per force generates a certain kind of content which is rooted in what they would describe as news values. Now if that definition of news values and its reflection in the mass media takes a longer time then you have a situation where socially relevant content takes a beating. I am not necessarily talking about science journalism because this is an occasion. We have had situations with regard to other equally important development items 
be neglected by the media. It is not that many a time that they neglect it by conscious design or it's a deliberate act. It is like the typical Hindi movie. A formula sells, a hero is there. So from chocolates to bricks, that hero keeps selling. And the advertiser keeps thinking that if he can sell chocolates, he can sell bricks, he can sell cement, whatever it is. So this kind of a formulaic approach essentially has allowed for neglect of certain important issues. And prioritizing those issues has been a rallying call from the outside sector. Within the sector, few journalists have reflected, few journalists have critiqued, but this criticism has come that what are you doing for development? So we had a phase where development journalism was the mantra of the 90s. Pioneers in this field, we had the Press Institute uh, experiments, we had uh, Alan Shackey, we had programs in the Philippines, we had programs elsewhere where number crunching, statistics, economic development, market information, all that become became important. What they said was that the role of a journalist is to allow for giving information that is complex in an easy to read, easy to digest format. This by extension became the norm for this field of science journalism, where science and doing science was considered either as complex or as in the realm of expert domain. And what is complex and what is in the expert domain needs an intermediary, intermediary and that intermediary has to be the media. So, science journalism was per force regarded as something so complex that it required the media to spend more time. But the nature and the sociological profile of the journalists that have come into the field, we have all kinds of people coming into the field. Uh, up to now, I don't think there is any uh, decent classification as to who a journalist is. We were at a gathering elsewhere and somebody talked about regulation, somebody talked about accreditation and so on. A, a lawyer cannot be uh, called a lawyer unless he or she goes through a basic orientation in law. You can't call a doctor if he doesn't have an MBBS degree. But try applying that to uh, journalists. Journalism degree is not a prerequisite for entering into the profession. Anybody with a conscious mind, with a critical eye, with an ability to communicate, theoretically can be a journalist. So, do we regulate the training institutions? If so, where do we draw the legitimacy from? Are we training the qualifications? If so, does the industry have the ability to pay duly qualified people the wages that is decent? Some of the wage conditions of journalists are pathetic, are really pathetic. They, they kind of live by the day. And that explains at times many of the practices. So we have a situation where this profession, although noble, although perceived to be held in high esteem, doesn't yet have a uniform layer of either perception or the professional 
requirements. So given this kind of a situation, if science journalism is complex, who should be doing science reporting? Who should be doing science journalism? This is the dilemma not for you and me. This is a dilemma for the newspapers because it is easy for them to get a bite out of a person saying that, uh, you know, I don't like him, he should be dethroned, etc. But it's very difficult to immediately come to the newsroom and do a story on what's happening in uh, Copenhagen or wherever it is. It requires that much amount of training, understanding. And many of the journalists, by nature, happen to come from liberal arts, humanities, or sometimes no formal education itself, as I said. Now, for them to get to the root of a process and put it across, either it requires an inclination or training. NCSCC, the Indian Science Writers Association, many uh, like-minded and committed organizations have in the past done exemplary work in trying to have courses designed for them. They have supported uh, university programs. For example, the Madurai Kamraj University had a fully funded NCSTC supported program in science journalism where students were also given stipend. Recently, uh, we have uh, taken that advantage, uh, Dr. Thirbal is here. We said that science journalism cannot be slotted so let us do science journalism as a component of our main course in journalism and communication. But we said we'll take the funding and have at least one course on science communication. So there are models and models available. So what has happened is that at one point in time, there used to be specific magazines and outlets which would unravel the mysteries of science to the common people. Today, you have fashion magazines, you have sports magazines, and the magazines that were dedicated to science have closed down because they feel that they don't have a critical figure which which they can claim circulation and consequently advertising revenue. So you have two categories of people who are doing science journalism in this country. One is very eminent scientists who feel that it is the call of their profession to be able to explain science to the common people. They are doing it in English language, they are doing it in Indian languages, that is one step. Plus, there are journalists who take it upon themselves as a special beat and uh, do stories. But here also, you see, if you see the distinction between uh, what goes on as AIDS reporting. Uh, the gentleman from uh, ICAMR, although it was very technical, uh, did have a paper which talked about, uh, you know, what uh, this micronutrient can do. The AIDS stories are, if you look at AIDS stories, both in print and electronic media, I think it, per it is perpetuating the commonly held belief rather than telling us that this is something that we can contend with. So horror, sensationalism becomes a norm and it defeats what would have been a good story to explain to the people what it is all about. Similar is the story of much more rampant uh, cases like TB, etc. We are doing good stories with regard to Chandrayaan space, it is because the establishment, Indian Space Research Organization, makes it a point to ensure that both its successes and failures are presented properly in a suitably evolved media kit. So therefore, you see a lot of coverage because their science, their technology is explained to the journalists. So the onus for science communication, apart from 
the interest that they have to show, and apart from the inclination that the profession has to have, is also on the scientific establishment. Unless the scientific establishment, what does it matter to people? People know, want to know, how does your science help me in my everyday life? That's a fundamental question that all of us ask. You see, uh, if, if, if an ad comes, somebody said, there should be campaigns, uh, washing your hands with water, etc. There are deep-rooted societal problems there. Water is a scarce commodity. It's easy for, uh, you know, uh, a well-cushioned middle class to talk about some of these practices. But when you really have to go in search of water for other basic needs, like cooking, I'm not trying to say that give away washing campaign, etc. But what I'm trying to say is that there are many other issues which are related to some of the things that we take for granted. So, when a society is asymmetrical, when there are other basic issues, unless you have science which demystifies and tells people that there are probably alternative means of doing things, the person will not be motivated. Why is an employment guarantee scheme a success? Apart from the advertisement, it, 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 it means that there is an incentive for the person that there is an access to 100 day wages. Similarly, science teaching in single teacher schools in the villages, one has to examine where, where science is headed. What is this uh, kind of fear that our children develop? First they develop a fear of mathematics, by the time they come to 7, 8, all the parents would be saying, they say 100 out of 100, 100 out of 100. Come 9th, the marks come down to 60, 40. By the 10th, it will be single digit. So, this phobia that is ingrained is dissuading people. Either we have pedagogical problems in teaching foundations or so, infrastructural problems. Because, you see, a person who has missed the bus in not being able to understand science, it becomes very difficult for him through mass media alone to di discover the virtues of science. I think what we have to do is to kind of look at science journalism or any advocacy oriented kind of a journalism in a holistic context. And this is where university programs, journalism training institutions have a very significant role because the how to do it part, the skills part, yes, it has to be taught. How to narrate a story, it has to be taught. Storytelling has to be taught. But apart from that, there should be considerable exposure for the students within their own university systems to try and understand what is the science that their faculty is doing. Now, I come from a University of Hyderabad. We are supposed to be the number one institution. And I'm sure that many of us uh, here uh, who come from that university hardly know what is the significance of this uh, Scopus publication that people are talking about. What does it mean to the neighborhood? Neither is there an open house, neither is there an explanation by the scientists. Yes, as somebody said in the morning, they are very good in seminars, but are they able to translate what relevance their work has? Every work need not necessarily have relevance. Either it should have relevance or it should be an interesting story. Unless we are not able to do either one of these two, exhorting journalists, exhorting media houses to spend more time on science journalism would be an exercise in vacuum. Today, we have many other means, as I mentioned in the inaugural talk. The appetite for electronic media for content is very high. And science journalism, somebody said that uh, today people are watching Discovery, people are watching NGCY, etc., etc. But one needs to understand that uh, each program of Discovery, each program of NGC costs thousands of dollars to make. We have uh, our GAM Darshan, we have our Science Channel, we have it's not that India doesn't have the infrastructure. Let us not uh, for a while 
uh, in fact uh, you know manoj was here this morning some of us even debated uh, uh, although i am less enthusiastic but we are even debating a dedicated uh, satellite channel for science communication I mean, it, it's on the car now we have dedicated channel for education we have dedicated channel for science we have dedicated channel for sports i think uh, you know too much of a dedication for slotted areas also is a problem because the human mind can comprehend holistically certain things unless it is able to relate these developments a bit of a sports bit of a politics bit of economic and then tries to appreciate its threshold of comprehension i think is better that way you have rather than slotting and saying that early morning science afternoon science in school science out of school i think the pedagogy of science i'm not here to preach pedagogy of science definitely has to change to sustain the interests of the children who are coming into the scientific domain two the quality of journalists in terms of their ability to do and write science has to improve and the scientific establishment which claims that it is the third largest or the second largest in the world has got to come down to the level of the people and explain itself as to what is the relevance of so many crores of rupees that is being spent for snt i think ncet scg etc are doing their job but i think what is happening is the csir labs the icr lab all are supposed to transfer knowledge from lab to lab and vice versa it is in their hands that science communication popularization press unless they network in a dedicated manner with the journalists we will have many more workshops and we will agonize continuously as to why science is not there in the media we must ask a larger question what has overall snt establishment done to popularize what has it done to sensitize people and today in the era of networking communication networking technologies social people say digital divide etc but i do have figures to say that this digital divide continuously talking about digital divide is perhaps some myth because today the situation is improving a lot we have as i said we have about 43 to 45% tele density and i think there is a Uh, 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 a situation where uh, the proliferation of mass media the phenomenal reach of the print media the expansion of the television the expansion in the telecommunication the delivery mechanisms are in place we need to search for content content cannot be generated by the existing profile of journalists that we have i'm sorry to say this this can be checked by anybody it can only be generated by the next generation you know trained journalism graduates unfortunately universities also are not doing they are more interested in process they are more interested in asking the same questions because they feel that their training has to emulate the practices in the field if the practices in the field have aberrations then that aberration continues and we will not be able to do uh, anything much about it